Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ted Wells, and I'm Vice President of Client Services at STEM Connector. We are a national organization focused on engaging employers in supporting a robust, equitable, and sustainable STEM workforce through groundbreaking collaborations. Our members include some of the largest employers in the world, leading post-secondary institutions and innovative non-governmental organizations with global reach. I invite you to learn more about our work by visiting stemconnector.com and to also subscribe to our daily and popular newsletter, The STEM Daily. Today, we are kicking off our Profiles and Excellence webinar series, focusing on how employer partnerships with historically black colleges and universities can and are supporting a robust STEM workforce. We are fortunate to have a distinguished panel of speakers from higher education and industry to discuss this topic. First, to introduce our panel, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Ingrid Ellery, who is Executive Director of Base 11, a leading NGO advancing STEM across the country and a longtime STEM Connector partner. Ingrid? Thanks, Ted, and, and hello to everybody. Welcome to the STEM Connector Profiles and Excellence webinar series, How Employer HBCU Partnerships Can Support a Robust STEM Workforce. As Ted said, my name is Ingrid Ellerby. I am the Executive Director of Base 11. For those of you not familiar with Base 11, we are a nonprofit 501c3 STEM workforce and entrepreneur development company empowering women and minorities with the access, awareness, and belief needed to succeed in next frontier industries of the 21st century, which are lively, they're largely either STEM influenced, STEM informed, or STEM related. Uh, Base 11 began our partnership with STEM Connector about five years ago, and this partnership has enabled us to join in some very impactful dialogues with like organizations like us um, that are committed to building a diverse STEM ready workforce through their research, their thought leadership, and hopefully soon some in person events where we can talk about and fuel STEM workforce strategies. Today's webinar is something near and dear to my heart as I am a product of an HBCU who passionately believes, as does Base 11 that there's an enormous amount of untapped talent within these institutions. And now I'd like to have the privilege of introducing today's moderator, Jay Espy. Jay is a partnership development leader at Stride Inc. Stride Inc. is an organization actively devoted to lifelong learning, diversity, and a persistent push for academic equity for learners from kindergarten to adulthood. Here's Jay. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for that kind introduction and for the wonderful work of Base 11 to grow the STEM pipeline with academic and industry partners. On behalf of this wonderful group of panelists, we also greatly appreciate STEM Connector for hosting this very special session during Black History Month. I'd like to go ahead and turn to our panels to introduce themselves. And I'll begin with Sunji Janga from the University of, Balt University of Maryland, Baltimore campus. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanji Jangha. I am the Director of Pipeline Programs here at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC for short. Um, we are a STEM Connector participant and have been for quite a few years, and I am the representative for us at STEM Connector. I'm also an extremely proud alumnus of North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University in Greensboro, North Carolina. They put respect when you say the whole name like that. That's, that's how you let people know. Uh, when I did a degree, my degree in mechanical engineering, I did my master's in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech and, and a master's in public policy here at UMBC. So I'm a big proponent of HBCUs. I know for a fact what they can do because it was my experience and my family's experience. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Sanji. Um, and I think I fudged University of Maryland, Baltimore County, not campus. Apologies. Next, please welcome Jackie Berry of 3M. Thanks, Jay. Sorry, I had to unmute there. Um, uh, first of all, good afternoon. And I just want to take a moment to thank Ted and the STEM Connector team for putting together such a timely event. I'm truly honored to be a part of this distinguished group. Um, I'm Jackie Berry. I work in 3M Gives. And as you can see from my, my bio, I've been with 3M for a number of years. I've had the fortune of having a lot of different jobs under one umbrella. I'm currently managed, I'm a, currently part of the 3M Gives team. And 3M Gives is the philanthropic arm of the company. And I manage all of our education investments. And we're just thrilled that um, we have wonderful partnerships with HBCUs and other organizations that support HBCUs. So I look forward to sharing more about our work and their work um, later in the panel. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jackie. 
And we're also pleased to have Olga Bolden Tiller from Tuskegee University. Please introduce yourself, Dr. Bolden Tiller. Thank you so much. Very excited to be here. Um, we've been a partner with STEM Connector um, since it was first started some years ago. Um, and very excited to be on the panel with all of the people today, um, including 3M. 3M was um, the gifter to our first endowed chair at Tuskegee University for a faculty position. Um, so um, these connections are certainly outstanding. Uh, my name is Olga Bolden Tiller, and I serve as a professor of animal sciences at Tuskegee University. I also have the pleasure of serving as the department head for our Department of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, as well as one of the assistant deans for the College of Agriculture, Environment and Nutrition Sciences. Um, that's my day job. <laughs> In my off time, um, I also have been a member of MANNERS, which is Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources and Related Sciences for over 20 years. <clears throat> and that organization supports individuals and allows for them to interface with role models from an early stage, including the K through 12 time of their existence. And so I've been very fortunate to be a part of that organization and now serve as the national president-elect for the society. So very excited about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, the Dean, Dr. Robin Kocher from North Carolina A&T State University. Oh, thank you, Jay. And um, everyone, it is an honor to be here today with this panel and with STEM Connector and with the topics of today. I am indeed the Dean of the College of Engineering at North Carolina A&T State University. And but I give you greetings from our, our university in general. Um, there's so much to talk about. And what's wonderful about STEM Connector is that they're enabling us to have the conversations. And so I'm looking forward to today and I hope, and we're, we're glad to see you all here and that you are taking time over the next hour to spend it with us. Thank you so much. And thanks for all of you for being here today. I dare say on the final days of Black History Month, our ancestors would call us their wildest dreams. And allow me to give some context for our audience uh, about HBCUs. These universities were founded because there were no other higher education system for Black students, in part because it was prohibited to educate Black Americans in parts of the nation, and also because some were denied admission to traditionally white institutions. In 1837, Cheney University in Pennsylvania became the first uh, historically Black college and university. And today, HBCUs account for about 2% of the nation's more than 4,500 degree granting institutions of higher learning. But Jackie, I can't tell you how many football games my parents who graduated from Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana took me to. And that competition with your alma mater, Jackson State University was fierce. Jackie, why did you cho choose to go to the land of the sonic boom of the South? And how was it landing your first job wearing the J State cape to help you fly? Thanks, Jay. Um, I have to say, growing up, I've always been a, a Jackson State fan. I went to undergrad at a different school, but always wanted to go to, to Jackson State, and it was just a phenomenal experience. I found it to be an incredibly supportive environment, uh, and it really helped, I think, just from a confidence standpoint, letting me know that I can do some of the things that, that were out there and giving me an opportunity to see people that look like me doing, doing some of those things. So it was a wonderful experience. I truly would not be where I am today if it had not been for, for Jackson State. So I, I love uh, the sonic boom. I try to get back home as often as I can. And uh, really now that we have a, a new coach. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. But yeah, it's, it was a great experience. And you know, I just, I talk to my daughter all the time about having an HBCU experience. Yeah, and, and you're talking about Dion Sanders as your new coach. <laughs> well, that's pretty amazing, and it's going to be exciting to certainly lift that program. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. And then we're going to turn to North Carolina A&T with Yu Sunji and North Carolina A&T seated at as um, one of the HBCUs HBCUs at the heart of the civil rights protest with students staging sit-ins and those bullet holes from that day still are present on the campus. And so as a student, Sanji, how important is that history to you 
And how do you use it to propel, how did you use it to propel yourself as a professional? So that's a great question. It's, it's critically important. Um, that was Scott Hall, which has since been torn down as it should have been, right? Because it was time to, to glow up. And, but that wall was preserved. And as a point of fact, one of my best friends, his room was literally on that wall. So we would hang out that window on a regular basis to interact with the campus. But as soon as you get there, you feel it, right? There's, a, there's an air of the importance of the culture. And there's a, a new kind of diversity because you are now getting to see what the diaspora has to offer, right? In terms of people who look like you, but are from different places, who are just as intelligent and excel in all kinds of things. I, I grew up in Montgomery County and it was one of the best school systems in the country when I was in high school and probably still is. And when I went to my honors classes, I didn't see kids like me, right? There were six of us. I still remember their names because it was only the six of us and we rotated through. Um, when I got to a &T, that that changed everything, which is why it was so important for me to go. Uh, it's funny you talked about ancestors. I'm a fourth generation college graduate, which is very unusual for our people. My great grandmother graduated from Howard University in 19, 1920, 1920. And a hundred years later, my daughter's a senior at Howard right now, right? And so it's not just about us going, it's also our children and the children that we support. We're showing them that you are, if not the intellectual competitiveness isn't the issue, but how you grow and how the institutions help shape you is what changes it. I, I appreciate that. And as a Howard University alum, I think your daughter made a really wonderful choice. Um, but like you, Sanji, um, my uh, grandparents graduated from Tuskegee University. And so I'm gonna turn now and, and say to Olga, uh, Tuskegee is arguably one of the most historic HBCUs with its famous first president, Booker T. Washington, and prominent scientist and professor George Washington Carver. Carver. Olga, how do you see these legacies as an impact to the institution even into today and the work that continues? Well, I tell you, Jay, when we have our freshman students come in, one of the first questions they're asked in freshman orientation is, why did you choose Tuskegee? And oftentimes, it's because of the history the legacy, the impact that the institution has had. Now, my background is in animal sciences and students come here with the interest of going on to veterinary school. We have the only veterinary school at a historically black college and university. And it has resulted in producing over 70% of all African-American veterinarians. So when we look at that history, we look at the first individuals who came and established the vet school even in the 1940s. And we see the legacy when we have freshmen coming in 2021 and they say that I chose to be a vet because I was able to see an African-American veterinarian and they graduated from Tuskegee University. So that alone speaks to the legacy and the impact. Um, I myself am a second generation college student. I went to Fort Valley State University, which was where my mother went to college. Um, my mother has four daughters. Three of us have gone to HBCUs. And I think that it shows the confidence that we were able to gain as students. And again, as Sanji mentioned, when I was in school and I'm from a rural town in Southern Georgia with one red light, and oftentimes I was the only black student in the honors class. And so to be able to go to a higher education institution and interface with other people and see them, I mean, it's very powerful. And at Tuskegee University, we continue that today. I can't tell you how many times during our summer programs that we bring high school students from across the country to our residential program for just two weeks. And they are so ecstatic because they see people who look like them as role models, but they also see their peers who look like them from all over the country that they're not the only one. And it's okay and it's exciting um, to be excited about learning, education, STEM, and not just the academic piece because oftentimes schools teach the academic piece, but it's okay to embrace that cultural background, things that people can say and they relate to them. And so I think that's very powerful and it's exciting to be a part of Tuskegee University and to continue to see that happen. 
I, I don't blame you. It's, yeah. it's a beautiful campus too. Um, and then I'm going to return back to uh, North Carolina A&T with Dr. Coldridge. I call her the Dean. Um, shine a spotlight on your work, if you will, and that of your esteemed faculty and the students who have made some very incredible accomplishments under your leadership, Dean. Oh, well, it's very kind of you to call me the Dean, but you know, it's funny. Uh, I have been the Dean of the College of Engineering here at A&T for the last nine and a half years. And whenever I'm having a difficult day and it's not a pandemic, I go into the hallway and talk to the students because they really do uh, remind you of, of what you enjoy most about, about what we do. Um, when I uh, think about what our students with their faculty are achieving, it is always just very exciting, right? Our students continue to embrace at North Carolina A&T's College of Engineering, the competitions. And so we're in so many of them because it's a wonderful forum for students to push and apply what they're learning in the classroom and then push it to new heights because of what they're doing together. And there's nothing like building something and then something goes wrong that you have to make sure you're doing the learning in order to compete. And so whether our students are competing in a hackathon or whether they are um, hacking into an electronic vehicle so that they can control it autonomously so that it can drive uh, in urban conditions. Those are the kinds of, of activities that our students are involved with because it allows them to build some of the skills that are so necessary for their fields, but also for the, the, the academic or the professional futures that they imagine for themselves. So that's what we're excited about because our student teams are always led by faculty as their coaches. And, the, and that really takes a lot of heart because the faculty that are doing that are doing that in addition to what they do in the research and teaching and service. So it is um, really humbling to watch the group dynamics as well as just what they're able to achieve and the enthusiasm and creativity and innovation that they apply to those various opportunities and competitions. Um, Dean, I don't know if you can tell, but the, um, the enthusiasm is spilling over into the chat. I love the conversation and the shout outs from the other HBCUs. We all love um, our HBCU family. Um, so I wanna give a shout out to uh, the, the hard work that everyone is doing. Data from the National Center for Education Statistics show that HBCUs awarded over 8,000 STEM degrees to black students in 2014, which was twice the rate as black students at non-HBCUs. Olga, is this data a surprise to you? I mean, does having a faculty and student body visible in these fields matter? It's not surprising to me because I'm familiar with the data. Um, it's disheartening to some extent because we know that much work has been done, but we know that there's so much more to do. Um, it is clear from my experience, the experience of others who have attended HBCUs that they certainly matter. And that having the opportunity to see a role model who looks like you, thinks like you, who just simply shares your culture and experiences matters. Sometimes it's not about what's in the text. It's not about having the fanciest, of equipment or having an official maker space. It's about when you ask a question, it's not misconstrued. They know what you're saying when you're asking the question or making the statement and you can move forward and do that in a very comfortable way. Um, I think that one of the reasons that I certainly came and decided to be in academia um, after doing a postdoc in a research institute was so that I could be a role model for others. I remember as an undergraduate student at Fort Valley, I conducted research. I was so excited. And I remember thinking when I grow up, because I wasn't grown yet. So when I grow up, I want to be in academia. I want it to be at an HBCU. And I want to bring these opportunities to students. And I'm very excited to have been able to do that um, in my discipline and disciplines throughout agricultural sciences. Very excited to be in the top five of graduating African Americans in this space, but also recognizing that, you know, you can be number two and only have 10 graduates in some of these, these STEM fields. And so yeah. that's why it's so important that we look more closely and, and that we involve everybody. 
um, everybody wants to come and get the best and the brightest. And I often say, let's fertilize so you can pick that fruit. So come on, let's fertilize. And we want everybody who wants the best and the brightest to help fertilize so we can have a very, very fruitful tree um, so that there are lots of students to select from. I think that is so important. And, you know, as, as we look at um, trying to grow the pipeline, I'm going to turn back to Dr. Kojer and, and say, when we look at the entry rates into STEM, especially computer science and retention of these students, particularly after that gateway course, data structures and algorithms, what is the strategy to get students to be globally competitive across the graduation stage and then into industry, Dr. Kojer? No, thank you for the question. I think in general, when you're talking about challenging courses in engineering and computer science and in STEM fields in general, it's important that the faculty teaching the course want and expect the students to succeed. You know, that faculty is in, indeed the subject matter expert, but they're also the coach for learning. And so it's very important of the attitude that they bring to the classroom and um, and because it affects the heart by which the students will attack their academics. So it's also important that there are supports are put into place, uh, whether it's by the department or whether it's by the college to help the students focus and dig deeper when they encounter difficult concepts. You know, they're supposed to have difficult concepts and they're supposed to encounter them. But these wraparound services, whether you're talking about uh, supplemental instructors or peer tutoring or any other resources that are valuable for helping the students persist, it's very important that they are indeed in, in the environment because it's that's what allows students to see that there's a community of other students who understand the material because that reinforces for them the fact that, well, if that person can do it, I can do it too. And then of course, because it helps enhance the classroom instruction. So you only have so much time in the classroom. So you want to make sure you have other ways that learning is also able to happen for difficult courses, even outside the classroom. And then I guess finally, I'd say that it's always helpful for faculty to assist students in understanding the context and the application relevance of the material. Um, students are not the same as they were 30 years ago or 20 years ago. They are certainly just as intelligent, but what they need and what they're asking for the questions of, of how to, why do I need to know this? You've gotta be able to answer that for them. And so there's a lot of different ways to do that. But I will tell you that the partnerships that we have with corporations are critical to how we help uh, students gain that context for why they're having to learn some of these subjects. Um, and when you do that, it allows the students to very simply decide that it is worth their time to dig deeper, to learn the difficult concepts. And that is often all it takes for the students to succeed and persist in those difficult courses. Um, and also help them see why actually learning this opens the doors for the professional trajectories that the students imagine for themselves. Because you're that's what I mean by the heart and mind of the student. You're trying to help them understand why is this actually important to what they have in mind for their future. Sure, and that, that certainly will serve them well going into a problem solving uh, environment at a lot of these companies. Um, and so let's continue to talk about supports for students and, and soon G uh, at UMBC, which is actually considered a minority serving institution. Um, how important are uh, these support systems for students of color that you've heard the Dean and Olga really talk about? We make all the difference in the world, right? I mean, we are, um, we're well renowned for a few things. We we won a basketball game, right? And so we were the first ever 16 to beat one and we have teachers and all that and that's great. Right? But in, in most circles, what you hear about is our Meyerhoff Scholars Program, uh, which has been featured on 60 Minutes and is, it was started for African-American males and it's expanded um, and it's, the program that produces the most African-Americans who go on to get MD, PhDs, our institution is. And that's a lot because of that. And then our president, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, who has always been a kind of champion of African-American and unrepresented student achievement in STEM. But all of that is around not just saying, okay, come and then go be great. That's not enough, right? It's building that grit, right? That Dr. Kojo was talking about. It is helping students understand that mindset that Olga was talking about you know making sure that they understand that not only can they do it, right, 
but there are people here to make sure you keep going because that's hard, right? Because in, in every major is hard, but in STEM especially, if you're a student who hasn't been exposed to this before, right? When you get into Calc 3, ordinary differential equations, that's not math anymore, right, that you've ever seen. So now you start to wonder, did I really make the right choice here? Or, or you know, when you start coding in Python, you're like, man, forget it. I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And where we see the attrition is not a college, we see it out of STEM majors and the non-STEM majors. And I'm for education, period, right? I believe every student who wants to go to college should and should get whatever degree they want. What I don't want to see is a student choose to become a nurse instead of a doctor because she didn't think doctor was possible, right? And for us to stop supporting that child and say, okay, it's okay for you to go just be a nurse, that's fine. That's what we have to do more. Being culturally competent is critically important. Um, and I really love what Olga was saying about that, that do you understand the language that our students are using to say, I don't understand, or I'm having trouble. And you can speak to them in such a way as to say, hey, don't wait until you fail the midterm to go get help, right? Because by then it's already too late. So let's talk about shaking some of those stigmas that you have, because you are one of a few in the class and you have to think about differently how you show up. Right, you don't want to be seen. I've had students say, "Well, I don't want to raise my hand because I don't want to think them. I don't want them to think I was dumb because I'm black." And my response is, "Well, you are dumb if you don't raise your hand and ask the question, right?" But at AT, I didn't worry about that. Everybody was black, so if that part of it takes away that notion, right? And, but we we have to think about support in a different way. The last thing I'll say is what's critical about these partnerships also is that pipeline notion, right? And that's what I do. So I run an upper bound math science program, which is first generation low income high school students. It's a trio program, right? I run an LSAMP Alliance, which we should talk about that's critically important in terms of the kind of work that we do there. And then bridge the doctorate and gym. So high school, college, grad school, what's common across all of those is that the students need to feel seen and they need to feel understood so they can be empowered, right? And that comes from everybody in the ecosystem. Because if it doesn't, it makes it very difficult for students to succeed. We're going to circle back in a few seconds, Soonji, and let you um, talk more about some of those programs on the campus. But I want to bring Jackie into the conversation and, and ask her, you know, as an overlay to what is taught companies like 3M. And by the way, you all are all over the place, uh, Jackie, during this uh, pandemic. Um, and just it, these are coveted, right? These are uh, th uh, N95 masks that 3M makes, but you're everywhere. But here you come in as a partner to help further develop this talent. How important are these alliances in strengthening the pipeline and helping to prepare students, Jackie? Yeah, Jay, that's a really good question. And I have to say they're incredibly important to, to companies. And, you know, we've really, in listening to this conversation, I think we've, we're, we recognize the value that companies can bring to the table. It's not just about the dollars for scholarships, which are incredibly important, but we're looking at, you know, how do we bring the full capability of 3M to an HBCU? And we, it's a time and talent of our employees. I mean, you know, having them serve as mentors, engaging in, you know, and we can talk a little bit more about this with our partnership with North Carolina, but engaging with case studies, you know, how do we show the relevancy of the things that students are learning in the class? And we, we can do that. We can bring it to the table. We can also bring in speakers to talk about uh, different topics. Just to kind of back up a little bit, 3M has been a really big supporter of HBCUs. Uh, back in the mid 90s, we started a sales program. And the intent of this program is to go in and say, we need a lot of salespeople that are ready to hit the ground running once they start working. So what we did in that instance, we started working with four HBCUs and then a, a local women's college here in the Twin Cities to say, if we started helping you develop sales curriculum, are you interested? And they did. And then in addition to developing the sales curriculum, we also worked with our businesses to create internship opportunities for students to come in, we'll take what they learned in the classroom and then work in three, with 3M in the summer. So to answer your question, the pipeline is incredibly important to companies like 3M. And I think we know that we need to do more than scholarships are important and we need to continue to do that, but also look for other ways that we can engage um, with students. Uh, understood, and and I know that um, this is not uh, you know a, a a a walk in the park uh, kind of um, 
deal here, Jackie. I mean, it, there's a lot of work that um, you do behind the scenes too. And we're going to tease that out a little bit. And I'm going to switch back to Olga and Sunji, who had those critical programs uh, starting in high school, going through college and beyond at their respective institutions that engage and support students. So shine a spotlight on those initiatives, please. And how do you all work with employers to support this important STEM work and get your uh, students inspired and motivated? I'll start with you, Olga. Thank you. Um, I would say that having these connections with industry are very important. We know that there have been cutbacks in education continuously for years. And so a lot of the enhancement and enrichment activities that were once a part of the education, they're not allowable because there's no funding there. And so we also need the direction from these companies as well because you know we want to be what's trending. We want to make certain that our students are able to meet the need for the workforce. And so at Tuskegee University, we have had the opportunity for years to partner with a number of different companies, um, programs, including our AgriTrek program. Um, it's funded by the USDA, but also we get funding from companies. Um, we also have our Verizon Innovative Learning Program, which we were able to connect with Verizon through work, our work with the STEM Connector and Base 11 to establish a program for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade boys to provide them with the opportunity to have access to emerging technologies. Imagine that they can now do the things that they see on television. AR, VR is not something that they're just thinking about and can almost see on commercials and they can see it and not only see it, but create it. So beyond the video games that they're um, taking part in. So they're able to create it. And so this has been very fabulous for us. Um, we see the same thing when we're working in our animal sciences program. We get lots of students who are pre-vet, as I mentioned before. And so having those opportunities to get that support so that we can establish programs that are supported by companies such as Corteva AgroSciences. We have our Let Us Academy, which is leadership and excellence by Tuskegee University students. So we hear the cries from industry talking about the development of employability skills and support and partnership with companies such as that allows us to establish programming that makes it a part of the fabric from the freshman year of our students getting those very important skills so that when they do transition back into spaces where they're one of few in the workspace, they have the skill set of how to address them, whereby they may not have had that skill set in high school when they were the only one or one of few. And so having that along with that technical skill and technical knowledge, I think is very, very powerful and so very impactful. And we see the difference. We see the change in the confidence from having those skill sets where students from freshman year are going into internships in corporate America, they are transitioning directly into hires from their internship positions. They are competitive, but they have that opportunity. That, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that uh, Sunji has programs, you mentioned the TRIO program, and there are a lot of uh, uh, funding and support with our government agencies. I want to just mention our queen, Claudia Rankins, uh, who just retired from uh, NSF and in a lot of these programs are, are critical for the sustainability uh, for HBCUs, but I'm, I'm not gonna talk anymore. I'm gonna let Sanjay take the floor. Sanjay, uh, talk, to, talk to us about some of these other programs. Sure, so there it runs the gamut. And so the TRIO programs, for anyone who is not familiar, are funded by the Department of Education and there are pre-college programs and then there are college programs and there are adult learner returning to college programs. So our focus, mine at least is on the pre-college, especially around STEM, right? So that's upward bound and upward bound math science, there's talent search, and then McNair and student support services are for in-college students, and then ELC, Education Opportunity Centers. See, you always use those, those acronyms. And veterans upward down are for returning learners. Um, what we focus on in the pre-college space is really um, not just the skill set part, right? But also the mindset part. And helping them understand things like we do a lot of growth mindset work with our high school students. Say, hey, embrace hard, right? When it's challenging, chase it. Work harder, do more. Be proud of the hard work. Difficulty doesn't mean you can't. 
It just means you don't know yet because there are lots of things that they don't necessarily get. Ours is an urban and suburban based program. And some of those schools are resource challenged. That's what we'll call them, right? And so we have to find other ways to offset and supplement that. So then that's the part where you start talking about, well, where are partnerships? We're grant funded. So we actually don't need the money part, right? For that specifically, it's more about the opportunities to see. So we've taken our students to NASA, right? To Goddard Space Flight Center. We've gone to Sirius, right? It's about exposing them so that you can engage them, so that you can inspire them, right? If a student doesn't know anyone in real life who's done something, then they're not gonna think that's something they can do themselves. They'll go to the hot fancy things that they see on TV. They don't know anybody who plays professional basketball, but they see it all the time. And so we're trying to make sure that they understand this path can be for you also. For, at the college level, it's uh, the LSN program. So it's the Lewis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation funded by the National Science Foundation. And Dr. Rankin was with the HBCU Up program in that same directorate in NSF. And that's really about uh, engaging underrepresented minority STEM students. Our alliance is UMBC, University of Maryland College Park, and University of Maryland Eastern Shore. And there's an HBCU alliance for Washington, Baltimore, Hampton Roads at Morgan and Coppin, and the other schools in the state are in. And we really focus on that same notion, right? That mindset, that grit, that stick to itiveness, but also research, right? One of the things that was most important for me in my engineering education was learning how to be efficient and effective at solving problems. I've taken that in everything I've ever done. And learning that skill alone has been life-changing for me. And so we're really pushing our students to understand, hey, there's more to what you're learning than what the book shows you. It's also how you're approaching solving those problems. And where our partnerships come in is for opportunities. We have students who go do research at APL, the Applied Physics Lab at John Hopkins. We have students who go off to other national labs. I was a national lab researcher as an undergraduate. And that was just because the professor who worked in my lab at a and said, hey, what are you doing this summer? I said, I don't know. He said, you want to go to New Mexico? I said, sure. And I went to New Mexico. And next thing you know, three summers and two fellowships later, I had been at Sandia for three years, right? At Sandia National Lab in Albuquerque. That got me a gym fellowship. So it's, it's about creating those opportunities and spaces and making clear to students, not only are you important and valued, but we're going to show you how you can create more value for yourself in the opportunities that we present. Does that, did I answer your question, Paula? You sure did, and more. Um, I, I love, you know, adding value and letting students feel as if they are valued. Um, and I know that there are so many other uh, partners and partnerships that are out there. Um, Dr. Kozier uh, does a lot of work with Amy, um, and I want her to elaborate on that partnership and, and discuss the opportunities there and in some other facets where you have done uh, this kind of work, Dean. Oh, sure. I'm happy to. So Amy, Advancing Minority Interest in Engineering, is an organization that is extremely unique and extremely important because it involves um, corporations, government agencies, as well as uh, engineering deans. And we're all in this organization together because when you are seeking to make sure that the nation is competitive, then it's important that you have the right people at the table and the points of view are not always the same. So Amy is a unique organization um, that allows you to have the discussions and the frank conversations that are necessary when you're wanting to make sure that you're not only putting um, token action to actions, but you're actually rolling up your sleeves and making sure that you're making a difference together in a way that affects the company, affects the universities, and also, again, affects the agencies that are involved. So that's very important. I also happen to chair the Council of HBCU Engineering Deans, which consists of 15 engineering deans, and those are deans that have ABET accredited engineering programs. And together we meet, uh, and again, we are also involved in AMI, but together we also meet because there is nothing like being able to have conversations together for those things that are this that we we all deal with, but also those things that are different because it allows a comparing of notes, but also an alliance so that things that we want to do to benefit uh, the nation's competitiveness, we're able to do together. 
So those are some of the examples of what's going on. And it's very important that I would say to anyone on this line today, on the Zoom today, that please understand that all of our HBCU uh, universities are, are different. We're unique universities. Just like when you think of PWIs, you know all of those universities are different. So it's not um, fair or the right plan to just do a broad stroke and just say, I'm gonna just take this package and I just wanna apply it to all these universities. Make sure that instead from a corporate point of view that your goal is to build a relationship with that university because that's the way that it actually works. That's how you deal with all your other partnerships. That's how your sustainable relationships work. You're actually working with that university to know what they want what, and what you want so that you can come to a collaboration that will work for both of you. So those are just some of the things I thought might be helpful to share with this group. I think that's so important. And, and thank you for the reminder that HBCUs are so different. If you've seen one HBCU, you've seen one HBCU. Um, and while a majority of African-American students matriculate at HBCUs, the faculty and student body populations are incredibly diverse. I'll mention that the in NSF data note that there are about 3% of faculty across all disciplines at non-HBCUs who are Black and 55% of faculty at HBCUs who are Black. Um, and so that, that's really important to um, keep in mind. But knowing that HBCUs graduated about 39% of students who are earning degrees in STEM subjects, Jackie, how is 3M helping to prepare more students to be ready to be hired into industry? And once they get into industry, Jackie, how are they mentor to stay and then even have a voice when they get there? Yeah, no, Jay, I think that that's a great question. I mean, we definitely look at the pipeline and what can we do as a company to support that. And it, you're right, it's not, we want to make sure that students graduate, they have the relationships as, as the dean mentioned, and that's so incredibly important. So we're work, looking at really how can we facilitate those mentoring programs so that students can start to make those connections. And then once you are in a workplace like 3M, we have what we call employee resource networks. So you, the affinity groups. And so, you know, people can come together and um, share their experiences, but also I think just the ability to uh, interact with people who look like them at different levels within the company and, and be supported that way. Um, you guys, you, we talk about the pipeline too, and I just wanna say one of the things that 3M is doing, we're looking at how do we start early to get underrepresented students interested and excited about STEM so that they can end up going to your colleges and universities and then on to uh, the work our workplaces. So we, we look at um, our investments in kind of three categories. We want to inspire students in you know the K through eight grades. You know, in the in high school, we want to make sure that they're academically prepared. So we're investing in programs that will do that. And then we talk about the, the scholarships and the mentoring programs. But I think if I had to sum it up, I would think mentoring would be key. And then once you're in the workplace, how do you make those connections, whether you're having a mentor or a sponsor or whatever, but making sure that, you know, the employees are connected and they feel connected to the organization and they feel connected to the mission of the organization and feel like there's a purpose there, that you're just not there for a job, but you are a part of a bigger, bigger thing that's happening. Those respirators, Jay, that, that, that you held up. I mean, you know, how do you feel like you're, you know, providing solutions to real world challenges? Absolutely. I mean, and we can all relate to real world challenges because your post-it notes help us do everything from take notes to, yeah. uh, collect, you know, and, and being serious though, you know, it's a simple thing to yeah. uh, have a post-it note, but it's so critical and valuable. Someone had to create that and someone has to sell that and someone has to um, be a part of that team. And so um, appreciate that. Um, again, 3M is everywhere. Um, and that's wonderful. Uh, I want to say that, as, you know, as a nod to computer science and agriculture, how do we continue to get the bugs out of the hiring system and partner with um, the academic world to influence recruitment strategies? And I'll, I'll pitch that to Sanji first and then Olga and Dean. No, I think that's one of the most critical questions. And one of the things we have to do is tackle the myth head on of we can't find them. Right. 
everybody who's been around an HBCU or work with underrepresented students has heard someone from some company say, well, we love to hire more people of color, but we can't find them. I say, oh, have you checked here, 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 here? And I can rattle off 10 places. Um, but if when they go, there's no one to say, yes, let me show you how to connect to our students specifically, right? Let's talk about your needs. Let's, let's establish that relationship so that it's a two-way pathway, then they still don't feel like they found a partner, right? They just feel like they found a place to get bodies. And that's not what we want to establish as an institution, right? We want, just like Dean Coacher said, partnerships. Right? One of my good friends is, is corporate and we talk constantly, he went to ANT with me also, about ways to leverage the things that he's doing and looking for, right? At ITW with what's happening on our campus. And so part of our responsibility, and, and I've heard this mentioned earlier, but it can't be underemphasized, is to make sure that we are actually preparing our students for the 21st century workforce, not just in terms of mind skill set, but also in terms of mindset, right? How to be flexible, how to be adaptable, right? How to show up when things go crazy and no longer in person, and everything's on the screen, right? How do you, how we make sure that the product that we produce in our students, right, is what companies need and can then use to be more successful. That's what everybody involved in this wants, right? Everybody wants to, to be able to do more with less. That is the nature of engineering problem solving. And so we have to help our students to be effective at that. The other thing that I'm a big proponent of, and it's a bias, is graduate education, right? And so also making that leap from, hey, it's no longer the paradigm of you go to a good school so you can get a good job, so you can make good money, so you can have a good life. Let's throw some other schools after that so that you can hone that training, so you can specialize, so you can really develop a depth of knowledge and understanding about the subject matter. But first and foremost, we have to get you to believe, to see that this is possible and believe that you too can do it, mm -hmm. right? That's so critical to all of this because if we're not getting young students of color to believe that this is possible, we can talk until we're blue in the face and they just won't pursue it, right? I'm two for two on my kids for HBCUs. My daughter's at Howard, my son's at Morgan. I'm 0 and 2 in STEM. She's an artist and he's a business major. And I'm okay with that. I'm at peace with it. They're, they're pursuing their passions, but we have to do more. And I show them stuff all the time. I mean, we make and build all the time. We have to keep showing them that there's so much in this that you can do. And it's not just build. Right? It's not just widgets. It's not just gadgets. It's all kinds of things. STEM touches everything. Right? And that's part of what we have to help them see that whatever you're interested in, there's a STEM job that's surrounding that. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I'm going to be mindful of time because I, I have just been a, a neglectful moderator and let the time slip away. I know we have audience questions too. And so I want to um, just uh, do a quick TV time out on, on the panel discussion and see if we do have questions um, that our audience wants to uh, weigh in on. And if not, then I will um, just let folks know too that um, uh, HBCUs receive about $425 million and that is about 1% of a uh, almost $40 billion in federal funding uh, obligated to post-secondary schools for, in particular, science, engineering, research, and development. And so despite making up 2% of those schools, that's, that's enormous. And, and that's not uh, including uh, other federal funding. But, you know, Dean, when you hear sort of stats like that, um, how, how does that make you feel and how do we still do what we need to do, um, but with very little? Yeah, um, there is not one of our institutions that is not under-resourced and under-resourced for all of our existence. And so when people are looking at the recent news and they see uh, partners investing in our institutions, that is, uh, we are so grateful for that and it is indeed needed, but I want everyone to realize that's on a backdrop of being under-resourced over time. We do what we do at our institutions because we know why we do that. We're doing it for the students and we know that the students have so much uh, that the world needs for them to contribute. 
But what we are always seeking is to make sure that companies are understanding uh, the quality of who we are, because we already know that but we're looking to make sure that we are not where we are today in 10 years. We are seeking to level the playing field and we're seeking to always make sure that the leaders and the well-educated uh, students uh, that are graduates that we're, we're sending out of our institutions, we wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to have the successful careers uh, and that generations behind them are also able to be educated in the quality way that we do at our institutions. And, and if you could, because Liz uh, is in the audience and she uh, wants to know more about the micro internships that may be uh, available at a and And if you do have them, have you seen the benefit of the exposure and development from this program? Well, you know, it kind of, it, I know we all use different terminology for different things, but by micro internships, what that generally means when someone asks the question is, are there ways that you're allowing your students to be immersed in a, a corporate internship, or maybe it's a virtual internship, somehow in their program without it perhaps being the traditional over the three months or a co-op. And, and we do that a lot of different ways. Um, we don't always call it micro internship, but it's really the same goal as we were talking about before finding ways to make sure that our students are seeing the applications of their fields and that they're responsible for um, deliverables that are valued by the company. And so we do do that a lot of different ways. We don't necessarily, in the College of Engineering, we don't necessarily call it micro internships, but we always are leveraging our partnerships to make sure our students are able to understand their professions and, um, and to be successful in delivering it. I think so. And, and then um, Jennifer uh, is in the audience too, and she wants to know some of the best practices, and Olga, maybe this is for you, uh, uh, some of the best practices that have been adopted in the past year to increase STEM innovation. Um, I think that one of the things that we have done is really taken advantage of the virtual environment. Um, we talk a lot about the import of having the schools interface with companies. Well, the virtual space, the normalization of it has really opened that up quite a bit. Um, at our institution and my department, we do have an advisory board that is composed of individuals from a variety of different companies. This past month, we had the best attendance ever because we did it virtually. And so being able to have that and then utilize those collaborations to offer informational sessions with those companies where the companies have individuals who work there to talk about a day in the life of, and not just a day in the life before COVID, but a day in the life of different jobs during COVID and how those individuals are still applying their skill sets. So we did have a virtual, what we call ag industry study tour. And so students were able to interface with professionals from a variety of different com companies. I'm getting those exposures and experiences. And I think that um, that's a one way that we and lots of others have connected. Um, I'm also the president-elect for Manners, as previously mentioned, and that organization has also taken advantage, providing what we refer to as opportunity fair shares, which are these virtual settings so individual students can come in and learn about these different companies, careers, expectations, etc., and ask questions that they have and get to see individuals as role models and they're, they're tangible, they have access. And so that's important. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Olga. Um, and, and I know that those uh, assets come in so many different um, uh, uh, ways. And uh, Carla is mentioning that, you know, there's some been, and we talked about this before, uh, you know, that big donors have been um, in the news providing scholarships and, and support for HBCUs is really important. Um, and she notes that it's critical, but does it really help uh, support and grow the institutions themselves? And, you know, I'll let Jackie um, weigh in on this too, because, you know, there are other organizations that are not, that have continued to do this work uh, and not all in the news, but, you know, Jackie, talk about how these kinds of, again, relationships, scholarships, and other kinds of partnerships do help grow the pipeline and help the institution, the institutions themselves. 
Yeah, no, I, excellent point. I think um, relationships are key. Uh, the dollars are important and, you know, we want to continue to do that, but it is about the relationships that we can have with the schools. What else can we bring to the table? How can we support schools in a different way? Is it investing in curriculum or is it engaging our employees to help uh, students understand the relevancy of the work that they're doing or the classes that they're taking? Um, and then providing internships on the other end so students can kind of see what it means, not kind of, but they can actually see what it means to work in those, those areas. So I think dollars are important uh, and we want to continue to do that. And one of the reasons that we put together kind of an advisory council to help us with some of our investments uh, in, in schools and in HBCUs in particular is to really look at ways that we can go deeper in the, in the engagement. You know, how can we start to build those relationships? How can we leverage some of the alumni that we have at 3M with some of the work that we're trying to do now with the, the schools because at the end of the day we want student success is what we're looking for and we know that we have to make more than an investment of dollars to make that happen so hopefully that it's helps. important yeah it does answer the question uh, dollars will always be important and, and i'll um just uh, i'm remembering and uh during my time uh, during the Obama administration as chief of staff of the White House Inif initiative on HBCUs, um, we did have to really make sure that um, the capacity was there to work with every single federal agency, which by the way, every president, um, every single president has written into their executive order a mandate that every uh, agency work with the HBCUs in some capacity. And that also means building the capacity too uh, for the work. Um, you know, and, and Title III, I think we've mentioned this, is not the only source of funding for HBCU STEM researchers, but other federal agencies that we've mentioned, uh, NSF, Department of Agriculture, Transportation, NASA, NASA is a huge friend, uh, NIH, uh, defense. And so there, there's so many other uh, funding uh, arms for HBCUs um, that uh, are available for uh, the, the growth and continued support of the work. I, I know that we have about two minutes um, and want to give you all an opportunity to have a final word here um, for guidance or advice for uh, HBCUs or the general audience or for our students. We can, anyone can start? Anyone can start, Dean. The I'll start, board. I'll start, but I'll keep it short. As companies consider their, uh, you, one of the questions you said, were, what are the bugs in the hiring system? And I think I wanna address that very quickly. And I think what I wanna say is, it's very, it's critically important that companies don't disconnect hiring from retention of who they hire. And so don't just count how many did we hire this year if you're not also looking at the cultures inside of your, of your organization to see if they actually are looking at the progression of the career progression of the talent that you hire and the diverse talent that you hire. Make sure that the company's norms include in, include those diverse team members in critical decisions and quality mentoring in the critical projects of the company. Because that is really what has people say that this is a great environment for me to work in. And that is also what makes them say, you should come join us also. Anyone else? I would say make certain that those partnerships are a two-way street. Um, while HBCUs can certainly benefit from funds and partnerships and what have you, we also have something to offer besides just the student talent. Um, when we talk about retention and making certain that there's a community, that relationship helps establish that continued community beyond just getting hired. That makes those students understand that this company is a good fit for me because it believes in where I came from and how I got here. And so I think that's so very critical and companies can really say a lot by having that. Well, I, I appreciate it. I, our time has expired. And so I want to thank our panelists for this engaging uh, profiles and excellence conversation. Sunji Janga from UMBC. That's Jack. not one thing, NJ? Yes, yes, go. I'll make it very, very fast. Yes. Diversity is not doing someone a favor. It <laughs> really is not. So if that's the mindset in your organization, Stop. That's not what this is. Bringing diversity to the table makes everything that you do better. Yeah. Okay, I'm good.
It, are, are we all good? Because I think that, that that's a perfect way to sort of close this out. Um, and But I do want to thank you all for uh, giving so much of yourselves and your time and, and the organizations whom you represent for this conversation. Uh, so Sanji, thank you from UMBC and, and Jackie of 3M, uh, Dr. Bolden Tiller from Tuskegee and Dr. Kodra, the Dean from North Carolina a and Thank you so much to STEM Connector members and the audience and everyone advancing STEM education and being true champions for diversity in STEM. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend and goodbye.